All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Live at Lunch. My name is Kim Goff. I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. And I would like to acknowledge the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nations, known today as, known as the Lekwungen people, in whose territory the museum is situated and where I live as well. With the warming spring weather and the appearance of buds and flowers, I think about Lekwungen ancestors whose land management and sustainable practices help shape this beautiful place that we enjoy today. How we think about this beautiful place and how we represent it and how we share it with others is the topic of our Live at Lunch today with Dr. India Rael Young. For those of you who have not been to Live at Lunch before, welcome. This is a free monthly series and each presentation lasts approximately 45 minutes and there's time for a Q&A at the end. India is the curator of art and images, and she's been with the museum since 2019. In that short time, she's helped us improve access to the art and images here at the museum and archives. And she's also challenged us to look more critically at it, look for the representation with women, indigenous and other cultures, and to think about what those collections say about us. And to talk more about that, please welcome India. Hi, everyone. I also want to give a brief uh, shout out of gratitude to John for also helping me get some of my uh, slides together today. I've been uh, technology and me have just been not walking in parallel paths, never touching. So without <laughs> you two, this presentation would not have been possible. Thank you very much. Um, today I'm talking about uh, how through photographs, tourism is represented in British Columbia. And I just wanna be really transparent here and say, this is not something that I've like researched deeply in any way. And uh, it's just something I think about often because we live here in Victoria, this very popular town because I work here at the BC archives, um, the site of tourism for the province of British Columbia. And so it's just something like I, I think about casually. So let's think about this as a, casual conversation. And with that in mind, who can recognize the three different uh, images on the screen from popular culture? They are all, all right, all right, we got one. Hit me, Katie. Uh, is it Revenant? It sure is Revenant. One of them. Ah, oh, beautiful. Is it Sabrina? Score, three out of three. <laughs> for uh, popular culture appreciation. Um, I, I, maybe we've all noticed, maybe some of us notice who watch a lot of Netflix, that British Columbia has uh, recently become a really major site for filming. Uh, the industry has been filming here for a really long time, but uh, what's happening in Vancouver and here in Victoria is, is on a whole new scale. Oftentimes, uh, the TV shows and movies that are filmed here do not specifically represent British Columbia, but sort of like the general Pacific Northwest, or sometimes mysteriously, New York City. Can't figure it out. <laughs> really doesn't look like Vancouver, just doesn't look like New York, but it just keeps showing up in the film. So there are all of these um, sort of popular culture ways that the landscapes, peoples, places, geographies, uh, communities of British Columbia are sort of seeping into the larger English speaking popular co uh, consciousness through British Columbia. And that kind of what, that's kind of what led me into wanting to talk about this topic through uh, what we know in from the BC Archives collections. Uh, so before we really delve into photographs, I wanted to also talk about um, some of the art collection. So the BC Archives also houses a wonderful art collection, much of which was created by tourists to British Columbia or visitors to British Columbia. And here we have Emily Carr's Northern Triptych. It is not of British Columbia, but it is of her cruise to Alaska in 1907. And so I kind of want to start here to think about how British Columbia is in so many ways part of an idea of accessing the North um, that has been going back much longer than we might think. Uh, so does anyone uh, have an idea of when people who work in tourism don't get to answer the question? Um, uh, when people started cruising to Alaska? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I mean, it's certainly less people just, you know, came up for a season, got really cold, lost a toe and went home. <laughs> when was the love boat phase? Like the 1980s, maybe? Uh, uh, keep going. Any other? Yes. 1986 is a great date if you go back a hundred years before that. Oh. So in 18, oh, I got to remember this. Okay. In 1877, over 5,000 people took a leisure cruise from either San Francisco or Seattle up to Alaska, stopping in Victoria and sometimes Prince Rupert on the way. So that's, you know, tourism was already sort of booming in this area, and it was already very much a, a notion of leisure, and not just people who were coming for the gold rush or people who were um, coming for uh, settling new territories. There was already this idea of, well, if I live on the West Coast of North America, whether it's the US or Canada, where am I going to go on holiday and who might I visit? Uh, or what like new experiences might I not be able to see from my home? Um, from the place in which I live. And so this is a representation by Frederick Martlett Bell Smith. He has a very long name. And uh, Bell Smith Martlett, whatever his name is, uh, was high, was one of the artists that was hired by the Canadian Pacific Railway to paint landscapes of British Columbia that would be used in uh, tourist brochures, but also used in uh, the media and newspapers, London Illustrated newspapers, Canadian Illustrated newspapers, L'Opinion Publique, to convince people to take the train out to the West Coast. So Bell was working in the same era that the CPR uh, and the various railways are moving in and through British Columbia. And I really love this painting because look at these poor, awkwardly dressed people in this wonderful British Columbian landscape. Because poor woman, she both but you must see like both freezing and like laboriously trying to climb through a mountain in her uh, in her giant bustled dress. It's so cold. I just feel like they're very cold and not not prepared for the weather. But it is very much representation, an idyllic representation of coming this direction. And so I like to use this image to think about how we think about. Uh, this place that is British Columbia and how kind of the world thinks about this place of British Columbia. It is majestic. The mountains are vast. There is always snow in the distance. There's, it's often unpopulated. There's, there aren't often people around. Um, if we go back to the, these images of films, we often, uh, this scene of an empty forest with just like one person walking through or a very small group of people kind of lost in the wilderness is a scene that we see recreated again and again uh, that sort of informs uh, how, how the larger world thinks about British Columbia. And that it is only tourists who are arriving to this spot, not people who already have lived here for generations and generations, whether those be indigenous people or people who have settled here. And Bell is part of both creating and perpetuating that story that was told. Um, here are some other great photographs from that era of early leisure travel into uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, one is another photograph also from Alaska from the Taku River Inlet. So, you know, if British Columbia just went all the way to the coast, the Taku River Inlet would be part of British, or the British Columbian coast. And we have thousands of photographs of uh, steamers and early cruise ships traveling up and down the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, there were a couple major companies that were cruise travelers, the Pacific Coastal Travel, uh, Alaska Steam Cruisers. Um, there's another one whose name is escaping me right now. Um, I chose this one of Alaska because I think it's the most uh, dramatically posed photograph. We have a lot of other really good ones, but they don't they don't have this like inherent drama and the, the photographers um, because what is the word? Photography was very challenging to do back in this era. It required a lot of equipment, a lot of unstable uh, chemical materials. Um, and it really was an era where the art and science of photography were being co-developed. 
And a certain group of photographers became very, very good at it. One of whom uh, was Edward Moybridge, who um, was a early founder of films. And he, Edward Moybridge, also cruised to Alaska um, and did a series of photographs of landscape photography similar to this one seen here. Um, and then went on shortly after uh, the 1890s to do a series of photographs of things in motion that then again led to the development of uh, film. So his landscape photography is much less well known than his uh, early precursors to film. But what he was really good at was riffing on the uh, visual tradition that was created by the Hudson River School, which was a school of painters out of New York, um, who painted the American West and in general, uh, the vast and majestic landscapes of the continents of North and South America. Again, in these really romantic ways with vast mountains sort of brimming with wildlife and greenery uh, and always devoid of people. Uh, or sometimes people are inserted very, very small as, um, as visitors to uh, the pristine wilderness of North and South America. So Moybridge in his very few photographs uh, of the West uh, works in this tradition. And so this is this talking in this photograph which is by an unknown photographer is sort of um, riffing on that uh, genre or style of photography that already like is quickly permeating how people are taking photographs. Uh, and then on the other side of that is um, the SSRP Rivet. RP Rivet was a really important guy here in Victoria. Um, oh, who's gonna know his relationship to the O'Reilly house? Anyone? Somehow he's related to the O'Reilly's. He uh, was a very big merchant in town. Uh, his wife was Elizabeth Monroe Rivet, so he was a very big, like, founding settler of this place that is Victoria. And he had a ship named after him uh, that was a leisure cruiser uh, that also toured up to Alaska. So this is uh, just the ladies' cabin of the leisure cru cruiser. And the BC Archive has a whole wonderful series of photographs of all of the interior cabins and the exterior and it docking in Victoria and then cruising up and down the coast, uh, leisurely taking ladies and other people um, around the places and coves and waterways of British Columbia. Mm. I'm trying to read my notes here. Do I have anything else to say about this? Seems like fun. Let's all go on a cruise. So I also want to talk about sort of the construction, the continuing constructing the mythology of this, this place. And I want to talk about that through uh, another photographer whose name is Agnes Cameron Beams. Has anyone heard of Agnes? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so Agnes is, uh, Agnes promoted herself as the first woman to travel to the Arctic. She was another local Victorian. She was the principal here at South Park School, so just a block, two blocks that direction. Uh, born and raised here in Victoria. And she was a, a lady of opinions, my favorite kind. Um, so she ended up leaving South Park School because of a disagreement with the school district and then decided to take a trip to the Arctic Circle. She left from Chicago. She traveled uh, like up through the Overlander routes and then went, I don't know like directionally what you would do, but you would go down the Mackenzie and then up the Slave Lake or down the, up the Mackenzie. Anyway, she made it to the North really, really far. And then she came back down uh, through the corner of British Columbia and out over to the ocean. Um, through one of those rivers, Skeena, like the Skeena River, something like that. Um, and she, photo she took photographs all along the way. One of the cool things about photography uh, in the early era of photography is it was a really non-gendered profession. So a lot of professional photographers were women photographers. And then sort of in the early part of the 20th century, when 
photography started being used for different kinds of things, much more newspapers, et cetera, it became a much more gendered profession and men started doing it more than women. But at this time, Agnes uh, documented her whole travels and then really like kicked off a whole new career for, her, for herself as a photographer and as a woman who traveled like the wilderness and the wild Canadian North. Uh, what is really uh, charming and different about her photographs compared to other explorers uh, or folks documenting exploration is that she almost always includes people in her photographs. Um, so here we see uh, two examples of that. Uh, here she is with a kid after they have gotten moose hunting. Uh, um, and then here she is uh, um, documenting a uh, Inuit man from the north in his summer uh, in his summer abode. And so we see his kayak, and then an umiak is the bigger uh, uh, structure there. And then these are two um, tents, like summer tents, for their hunting. And an umiak is used for whale hunting. My kayak is used for just cruising around. Um, so the, what else do I want to say, Agnes? Agnes, oh, Agnes also yeah, participates in the, uh, in telling stories through lantern slides. So by the time Agnes is traveling around, photography or film is making its way into the world and the region. This is around the same time that Edward Curtis is working with the Kwakwakwak community to film in the land of the headhunters. Um, but lantern slides are still sort of the most prevalent way of getting into smaller places like the towns of British Columbia to tell stories about what people are up to. Lantern slides were made with glass plates. Um, so they were a form of photography that was both fragile, but also uh, portable. And then you would use them individually, like the oldest version of a slideshow. And so here in the BC archives, we have transcripts of uh, Dean's lantern slide presentation. So they're very animated, and uh, you know she drums up all this excitement about her, you know, being a single voyager and a woman doing breaking new frontiers meeting uh, unknown people and entering a very vast and foreign places. Um, and so part of her language uh, exoticizes this place that is British Columbia and the people who live here and also um, positions herself as coming from like the very urban and uh, you know British place that is Victoria. Uh, or she, as she often positions herself as American coming from Chicago, which is where her travel started, um, rather than a person who actually lives in the same place in which she's traveling through uh, and has grown up in a place in which she uh, positions herself as just passing through. So it's an interesting uh, story that she tells. And again, a story that we see time and again. Uh, all this is not possible without the uh, railway. And rail along with cruising was another sort of main avenue for not just moving people and things from places, but for true leisure travel. And back in the day, there were hotels built all along the railway and people like Frederick Bell uh, would illustrate these, these hotels as you know, places to come for the summer. This was also an era when people would live in a hotel all summer long. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Empress was one of those hotels where, where people um, would, from Ontario would decamp to all summer uh, or uh, Alberta or Manitoba. And then I always remember these lines in Ellen Montgomery's novels um, about Prince Edward Island. Um, when Anne gets to go to the White Sands Hotel and she gets to mix with that class of people that summer in PEI. So the, the Brit British Columbia is sort of the counter version to this very specific culture of leisure um, that uh, runs along the Canadian Pacific Railway line. So here we can see one of those luxury hotels right here and it is uh, dramatically situated 
in this photograph um, uh, to tell that narrative of come out west to these vast, pristine places with mountains as tall as the Alps um, and pure glacier waters. So this is another version, not the same place, um, but another representation of those hotels. So this is a, a colored postcard that is taken from, from photographs. So this is also the era where folks are um, manipulating photography um, to be more dramatic and to tell stories by hand coloring things. So this is a wonderful example of a hand colored photograph postcard that you could of course buy on the railway and it was reproduced again and again in media about encouraging folks to travel west, young man. Uh, now I'm just gonna jump to these great photographs. Uh, so this is an artist who is relatively unknown. And if anyone knows anyone who wants to work on like a master's project or a dissertation, we need to spend time with Gus and Margaret Maves. So the BC Archives has Gus and Margaret's bonds. We have over 3000 of their photographs including uh, albums of theirs, lantern slides, and their glass plate negatives, many of which are hand painted by Margaret herself. Um, one of the contributions that I've made since I arrived here is, until I got here, Gus was the only person acknowledged on the fonts. And when I learned that Margaret was actually the person who hand painted all of Gus's artworks uh, or photographs, I was able to add that information into the collection, but that's just a tip of the iceberg of what can be known about uh, Gus and Margaret. And I don't have time to research everyone. So tell someone to come <laughs> research Gus and Margaret for us. They lived here in Mill Bay and they photographed artwork specifically for tourists. So their business of photography was to cater to the tourist market that was already coming to Victoria through the cruise lines, through the CPR. And so they were very interested in creating this picturesque image of the very specific place that is Victoria. Um, and they're wonderful. So here we can see a, an original box, series four of his lantern slides. They are super quality. Uh, and they are great photographs for only $2 each. So anyone visiting Victoria could get a, a print of the beautiful Bouchard Gardens um, and many other places, um, hand colored by Margaret. We were trying to figure out, uh, John and I, John helped me scan these yesterday. Um, if this is the correct way this picture sits or is it backwards? Anyone want to hazard a guess? We're, we feel like, we're feeling good about this direction. Backwards, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, so because of course Q-Turks is built into the query, this is the, so this side would be like out to the inlet and that would be into Spanish, but your sense? Does it still look like that? Or? It doesn't quite look like that anymore. Yeah. Uh, it feels like now that the lake is kind of making in that corner. I don't know. Gus and Margaret. That's so cool. We like a table from somewhere where the very go round is now. Back to that over the fountain. Yeah, that's so I was. I <laughs> there's a boat. No, not that. Fresh water. Yeah, there's no water in there. In the back of the photo, I think that's the lookout into the sunken garden, and you would walk down, and that's the sunken garden. And then this is the, the lake now at the end where they just have the Bellagio like fountains going. Yeah. And then you wrap around and go back the other way. We think of so too. We'll have to go and do field work. Exactly. <laughs> We're, let's all go do some future gardens, field work, yeah. around tea time. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Saturday. August Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, preferably in July or August. We had a picnic. <laughs> <laughs> What is also great about Gus and Maeve's photographs of this time is the notion of how widely they spread. So, you know, the beautiful thing about photography is that it can be reproduced again and again. And like a postcard, it's something uh, Gus and Margaret Maeve's photographs were something that you would get when you come to Victoria to remember your visit here and to take away with you. And I mean, I still have photographs from the first times I visited Bouchard Garden. So we think about sort of the collective. Uh, memory that is carried through uh, photographing the sunken garden again and again, generation after generation, um, is a, is a powerful like conscious that we carry with us about this place that is Victoria. And here are some other um, sort of a subliminal uh, vistas that we kind of hold in our mind. So this. Uh, Painting up in the corner is not of British Columbia. It is Tom Thompson's uh, The West Wind. It is done in Ontario on that lake that Tom Thompson always visited. Wherever that is, if any art story wants to, <laughs> to shout it out, it's not coming to me right now. But it is. it became so iconic so quickly as a group of seven artwork, as the notion of uh, the modern Canadian landscape, again, empty, vast, one perfect tree just draping over a body of water, uh, that it has become uh, synonymous with this place that is Canada. And in many ways, also this place that is British Columbia. So here are two other renditions of that. And there are infinites that we find in the BC archives and that you will now start to see everywhere you go. Um, so we have Walter J. Phillips, uh, who was a prairie artist, mostly in Winnipeg, but he would visit here every summer, and he worked in beautiful watercolors and had this very Japanese-influenced uh, printmaking that he did. And so he specifically liked to paint Arbutus trees because they have um, like a visual semblance with Japanese printmaking style. And so here is a vista of Phillips's from you know any cove here in um, Victoria or along the island. Uh, we, again, that one beautiful elegant branch, the water vista in the background, and then another one from Beth and Margaret, which is a photograph, a handful of photograph again of our beautiful tree. And I think this might be in where the boats come uh, back in Sydney over over the charts. Yeah, I not, I'm not totally sure about that. Again, we're going to field trip this on a Saturday in July. Um, I'd probably arrive by boat just to be sure. <laughs> the sandy beach and blue charts. Not the sandy beach and live on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. It really could. Uh, and it is that sort of framing of the photograph. Uh, that, that is something that, you know, have you taken a photograph this way? When you were out holidaying on Pender Island, doing a long walk, did you see that one tree and think, I'm gonna Instagram that? <laughs> it's because there is this long subconscious history that we have of, um, of, of the repetition of very specific ways of looking at British Columbia. Or Canada. This is another classic. Um, so these are three different photographs from Beautiful British Columbia Magazine. Beautiful British Columbia Magazine began in 1959, uh, really picked up in the 70s and the 80s, and then kind of transitioned into maybe it went dormant for a few years, and now maybe it's just called British Columbia Magazine. Um, anyway. What is beautiful British Columbia magazine? Um, the province of British Columbia was very specifically interested in promoting tourism to British Columbia. Uh, there's a really fun book called Selling British Columbia by Michael Dawson that I highly recommend, um, which does a much better job than me talking about the various ways in which 
the federal and provincial governments work with local governments in Vancouver and Victoria to get people to come to British Columbia and the imagery that they used to do that. Uh, Dawson really talked specifically about the representation of totem poles, which is a really great chapter that, uh, again, they just, if you see a totem pole, you think British Columbia is an iconic um, hand in hand, or like a, what's the symbol? If there's a better word for symbol, but it's not coming to me right now. Um, and then the other thing is fishing. So strategically, uh, fishing and sports fishing specifically was promoted heavily throughout the 20th century. Um, and the strategy for fishing is, is uh, the, it, it builds on the mythology that Agnes is creating and that uh, folks like Bell are creating, which is that one lone figure just out there in the vast British Columbian wilderness. So there's always a body of water. There's always a big mountain in the background. Um, and uh, it's great fun. So, and oftentimes it's men. We've got all these big guys just being really manly, getting out into the landscape. And then Roy Henry Vickers, uh, genius uh, artist, lives in uh, Hazleton, has a gallery in Tofino. Uh, Roy, Bought his gallery in Tofino right around uh, 1975, I think about 1978. Um, and side note, I did a dissertation on indigenous prints from the Pacific Northwest a few years ago now. And I interviewed like lots of people. I interviewed all kinds of artists and dealers, and then just general people. I was doing the dissertation at the time down in the US. And so I just kind of asked people. Like what artists do you know from uh, the Pacific Northwest indigenous artists? And people didn't really know that many people. But everyone knew Roy Henry Vickers, and everyone knew uh, these specific kinds of photos that are the dramatic sunset with like dark landscapes around it, and that that like rainbow blue sky to bright red sunset, one figure doing something, one boat cruising through the scene. Um, so Roy Henry Vickers um, like built an entire career on the the like the the majesty of British Columbia um, of visiting British Columbia, not living in British Columbia, but people who just come here and get to see this one time of experience. Uh, so this is another example of Roy's work. Roy is also really influenced by Japanese printmaking, and this is another great example of it, uh, where he uses these really, really subtle lines um, to create the impression of rain, which I think is beautiful and genius. He's very good at um, mm -mm -mm. So there are 309 results for the term fishing when you search the beautiful British Columbia photographs in the BC Archives collection. So in the BC Archives collection for beautiful British Columbia, we have about 4,000 photographs. Um, and fishing is a, is a main story that they are telling, you know, magazine by magazine, year by year, decade by decade, um, infinite, infinite. Uh, I just brought this one because I like it. It's also from Peter beautiful British Columbia magazine. Um, it's kind of moody. It feels like Riverdale or Sabrina could be filmed here. Um, but it's called Landscape for a Sasquatch Story. Uh, and I haven't found the article yet, but presumably there's an article about Sasquatch. Um, another icon of British Columbia, another mythology that British Columbians work pretty hard to create and continue. And of course, there are many indigenous histories of uh, what the white folks might call Sasquatch that come from uh, Lekwungen lands and Musqueam lands, um, which is another great figure that's often represented in indigenous prints as a tangent. Am I supposed to be standing next to this? Buddy? No, you know. okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I showed you this because I like it. Just a great photo. Uh, and who doesn't like Sasquatch? and isn't looking for 
a Sasquatch every time we go hiking. I know I am. This is another great story that is told in beautiful British Columbia magazine that is a story that is being told again today and that um, the people who work in tourism are working really hard to tell the larger world about British Columbia and it is that we make wine in the interior. Um, so this is the uh, champagne bottling room for Kelowna Winery from, I feel like that date's wrong. I think this is supposed to be 1956. And if we look up that number, I can, I can be corrected. Um, uh, and it is true that we make great sparkling wine. And I feel like everyone needs to know this about British Columbia because it's not told enough. Not all of our wines are great, but our sparkling wines are legitimately delicious. And we'll bring one on a picnic when we go on our pitch out of this. <laughs> Um, so this is something that is carrying on through the ages. Here we have another wine tour in 1978, correct date. Love these two kids that go on a wine tour. <laughs> That's me. That's my brother. No. <laughs> um, but it is a great story. Uh, and a story that British Columbians are building up more and more today. And so uh, I'm interested to see how the visual history of this plays out maybe in some of the films that are uh, being shot here in British Columbia. Uh, so if anyone sees, sees a new film uh, at one of those wineries, let me know. I did look up the photo in 1956. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Kelowna Winery is still around, um, which is a uh, very, we, sometimes the, the narrative that the winery industry tells is that Wine, wines have come to British Columbia, kind of first California and then Washington and Oregon. And now British Columbia is this place of wine. But in fact, it has, uh, the industry has been here for a really long time. Especially great terroir for champagne. Uh, oh, and this is a little bit about how far the marketing folks are able to tell the story. So I couldn't get a photograph of this, but this is a video in the BC archives of, of a tourist film, big game, uh, camera holiday, German version. <laughs> so uh, along with fishing, big game hunting is something that British Columbia promotes to the larger world, very heavily in the 20th century, but still very much today. It's a big part of our story where people come here uh, for fishing tourism and for big game hunting tourism. Um, and this is this particular video was made by the uh, Department of Recreation and Conservation and a photographic branch of that department, specifically to encourage Germans to come and hunt here. Germans really do love the mythology of our tall mountains and our very big animals and the hiking that they get to do here. Uh, it's a community that has uh, to, uh, traveled to British to this place um, for decades and decades. Um, so it's a nice, it's a shared history of the idea of British Columbia, only specifically through the lens of tourism. And I want to give a shout out to Jennifer Bonnell, uh, who has written a totally amazing book about uh, the history of wildlife in these lands that are now known as British Columbia. Um, so, and it's not just the wildlife, but it's how humans re relate to the wildlife of this place, sometimes caretaking for them, and sometimes uh, not doing great things to the habitats for the animals that live here because of our, uh, the industries that also occur in British Columbia. This book is not out yet. It will be out in the fall. And it's being published by RBC and Press. So keep an eye out for it. It's a, it's a real page turner about this beautiful place. And she has a wealth of photographs of big game in British Columbia, uh, which are really fascinating if you don't mind seeing the dead papers. Uh, it's a great story. And it's also a great story of um, land use and how land use is impacted by tourism. Uh, in places like Vancouver and then places in the far north. And these are just some photographs. 
but I forgot to research. Mm -hmm. um, author of Mona Lisa, nineteen eighty. That's just my template there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, these are actually newly acquired into the photograph collection. They we do not encourage this. This is not a good thing to do. But someone left them here about a decade ago, and when I got to the collection, they had just kind of been sort of withering away in one of our um, storage areas. And when we looked at them, they were all of these great photographs. Um, um, people just be on holiday in British Columbia. They traveled through the interior. They traveled uh, through Haida Gwaii, mostly in the eighties. Um, so I think, I think these, well, I think these three are all uh, from the Kelowna region. Um, and they're just someone's personal memories of travel. And I did pull this one in strategically because if whoever is taking this photograph is positioning it in that subconscious way of, you know, a little bit of land, a lot of water, really beautiful mountains in the distance. Um, it's not hard to take a great photo. I realize like I'm getting a little, oops, tight on time. Uh, so I'll end with talking about, I didn't do this one either. Uh, this this is a very cool photographer named uh, Frank Boucher, and he we have a collection of his photographs in these archives from when he was visiting, possibly in the army, possibly not, but certainly during World War II, um, he was traveling around Victoria and the nearby islands, and his photographs are excellent. Um, you might. I'll recognize that taking a really good photograph uh, is harder to do than you would think. Um, and that sometimes when we have consciously uh, intuited, oh, we, you know, this tree, tree here, we put it off center, and it's gonna look good. Um, but a lot of times when you try to do that, it's very hard to turn out. And so the BC archives has over 5 million photographs, the majority of which are either government photographs or taken by amateur photographers like Green Badger, but uh, so it's very rare to find really good photographs. And all of his are great, you should look them up. And this is a super fun one of uh, folks going to one of the golf islands. Doug, just looks like a good time. Uh, and then in my mind, I had a slide of Adad Hannah's. Um, videos from COVID. So Adad Hanna is an artist from Vancouver. And during that first year of COVID, he created a series of portraits that, uh, that chronicled the entire year. And they're not just, he took photographs, but he also took, he asked people to stand still for about 30 seconds uh, to create what's also called a tableau vivant. Um, so I'll just play this one as a, um, okay, there we go. Now let's see if I can, what's going to happen when I do the sound. It just has a little mute at the bottom. Okay. Okay. Uh, they are wonderful and very, very moving. Uh, and he has, he has a, in the middle of the series, um, you can tell he's gone on holiday in British Columbia. And he has all of these wonderful photographs that are obviously of his family and friends who he's holidaying with in the COVID times when we're, you know, in our own bubbles and doing our own thing. But they're just, they, they come across as, you know, just what the world is living through. People, especially British Columbians, trying to figure out how to spend time with family while still being, you know, distanced uh, from each other. And regrettably, I, oh, wait, hang on. I don't, 
I didn't get the photographs into my slides of those holidays. No, I didn't do it. Uh, but they're really great. I'll figure out how to post one online. And uh, I will also be plugging another book coming out by the Royal BC uh, Publishing uh, Program. And that comes out in May, and it is all of Adad's uh, 237 photographs. They all have a little interview uh, with the subjects. And then if all goes right, you'll also be able to uh, access the videos through like a QR code. Um, so you can see these really touching, wonderful stories and hear from uh, the people of British Columbia about our life during this quiet time. And that's, that's what I got. Thanks, guys. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Any questions? Would anyone like to ask a question? I have a side note. Uh, sure. If you go back to the chamber, 